Um, all right, so I'm actually going to tell a much simpler story than we had in the, in the very nice previous talk. This is also about stochastic block modeling, but in the vanilla, the vanilla version with just uh, two communities. And the point I'll try to make uh, will be more of a computational nature. So this will be, this will be a bit uh, different in the, the kind of questions that we ask uh, about this problem. Okay, so the model is, uh, is fairly simple. We consider that there is a collection of n objects. And exactly n half, exactly half of these objects are blue and the other half are red. And uh, just like in the previous talk, uh, there's going to be some edges between the uh, objects. And uh, the probability that two objects of the same color are connected is p. And the probability that two objects of a different color are connected will be q. And we think of q as being smaller than p here in this case. Okay. And uh, well, the statistical, uh, one obvious statistical question to, to ask, the, given this model to generate random graphs, is simply generate the graph, mix up the nodes, remove the colors, and then the question is, given one realization of this random graph model, this, given one observation, can you recover the colors? And if that's not possible, can you say something non-trivial about the colors, something non-trivial about the partition that was, uh, that was hidden? Okay, and I'm, I'm going to consider mostly uh, two noise regimes. There's the difficult one, which we had in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, talk, where the probability of having a, a, a link between two objects of the same color scales as A over N, where A is some constant, okay? And the probability of getting a, a node between communities is B over N, where B is a smaller constant. And I'm saying that this is the, the difficult regime uh, in some sense, because we know that if we just look at the blue community, for example, and you just uh, look at the basic results about Erdős Schrödinger graphs, and you know that with high probability, not even the blue community itself is not going to be a connected component. And so there's going to be small islands of this community that are disconnected from everyone else. It's going to be very difficult to state without any mistakes for each uh, of those small islands of which color it was, okay? Because it's not, there's not much information for those. But what is still true is that each of these communities individually is going to have a giant connected component, where we say that it's a giant because its size grows linearly in n. And this, this says that, well, it should be possible to, re to say something non-trivial about the, uh, the partition in the sense that we should be able to do better than random, essentially. Not get quite the colors quite right, but say something that's better than random. Um, and the other regime I'll be looking at I'm going to refer to it as the dense regime. And this doesn't mean uh, that the graphs are going to be dense, but it's just that there's sufficiently more edges in the graph that our life is going to be uh, a lot simpler. In this regime, the probability of two similar objects to be connected grows as log n over n with some constant alpha. And the probability of connecting two different objects is beta log n over n, where beta is a smaller constant. And uh, this is much simpler because now with high probability, if alpha is not too small, we know that the individual communities are going to be connected. And this is telling us that maybe it's going to be possible to recover the partitions exactly. Okay? All right, so this is all very well known. And uh, I'm going to state some uh, information theoretic uh, limits in, in a somewhat loose way. I, I'm j I, just want to convey, um, I just want to convey the main difference between the two regimes with one number. And so, so you'll, you'll forgive me if this is not quite exactly the right uh, the right formulations, but there's something I call lambda here, which is not the same lambda we had in the previous uh, presentation, uh, which is a function of p and q, the probabilities. And uh, I think of this lambda as my signal to noise ratio in a way. This lambda determines how easy or difficult my task is. And um, of some approximation, what we know is that to say something non-trivial about, uh, about the partition, we're going to need lambda to be bigger than one. And again, up to some approximation, to Get exact, for it to be possible to get exact recovery, uh, we're going to need lambda to be bigger than something that grows slowly with n. Okay, it's not going to be enough to have lambda bigger than a constant. No. All right. Um, now, this is just a statement about what is possible or impossible. And uh, like I said, I'm going to orient this talk more towards computational questions. So we want to look at uh, polynomial time computable estimators that actually uh, reach these information theoretic thresholds if it's possible. So efficient ways of actually performing the estimation. And it's uh, well known that there's a maximum likelihood 
there's a semi-definite relaxation for the uh, maximum likelihood estimation associated to this problem, which is in this form, where uh, A is the adjacency matrix of the graph that I observed. This is a random matrix. And I'm going to shift this matrix by uh, essentially its constant, the constant, uh, the, uh, the average value of the entries. This gives me some matrix A prime that is going to come back uh, in the following slide. And uh, the semi-definite program that we're going to look at is the following. X is my variable. It's a pretty big symmetric matrix of size n if there's n items. I want to maximize A prime X, the dot product between A prime and X, the trace of their product. And the constraints are that X has to be positive semi-definite, and the diagonal entries must be all one. Okay? And there's a, there's a simple way of showing that this is actually a convex relaxation uh, to uh, the maximum likelihood estimation problem up to a small uh, up to a small uh, hack. Okay. Now, um, what is known about uh, the semi-definite program? What do we know about its solution with respect to the statistical uh, problem that we're looking at? Well, we know that if we're looking at the uh, constant average degree regime, the first regime that I talked about, uh, provided you consider p plus q over 2 times n, which is the average degree of the nodes to be big enough, so provided this is big enough, you can get away with making lambda bigger than 1 plus some delta. And you can make delta as small as you want if you make this large enough. And what I mean by lambda bigger than this is enough is that if you solve this semi-definite program, then there's a way of transforming the matrix X into an estimator that does better than random uh, in terms of uh, estimating the partitions. Okay? And for the other regime, the situation is even nicer. If you solve the SDP, then with high probability uh, in, this, in the dense regime, uh, the solution of the SDP is actually going to be a rank one matrix that tells you exactly where your partition should be. Yes? Uh, no, so if you uh, pick a delta, well, yeah, large enough depends on delta. So if you want to make delta small, you need this to be bigger. Yeah. All right. Anyway, the point is, um, if you solve this SDP, then, and you can do this in polynomial time, you can get pretty close uh, to uh, what the information limit tells you. So now we want to solve the semi-definite program. And my point is going to be that this, even though this you can do in polynomial time, it can take, uh, you know, it can take a while. And so uh, I'm going to describe now a simple-minded alternative. And uh, I'll try to show that uh, for the statistical uh, problem at hand, it actually makes sense to consider that alternative, even though it's going to be a non-convex non -convex formulation. Okay, so we have the semi-definite program. And uh, I'm, I made a statement that uh, classical methods to solve it, interior point methods, uh, tend to take a lot of time if n is big. Okay. Now, the main reason for that is twofold. One is that uh, if n is large, x is going to be n squared large. Okay. So the dimensionality of this problem is pretty big. And also, it's not so easy to enforce this conic constraint that connects all of the entries together okay, in, a, in a subtle way. So a simple-minded approach to evade this, uh, this issue is to introduce a new variable y, and I think of y as being a tall and skinny matrix of size n by p, and I control p. And I'm just going to uh, factor x as y, y transpose. Now I parameterize x as being the product y, y transpose. And y is this tall and skinny matrix, and I just uh, plug this into the problem above and see what happens. Of course, x here becomes y, y transpose, likewise here. But now, uh, this constraint, I don't need to do anything. It's mechanically enforced, so I don't have to work at all for it. And uh, with respect to the dimensionality of my problem, just by tuning p here, which admittedly changes the problem then, that I'm looking at, just by tuning p, I get to control the dimensionality of the problem that I look at. So we're going to go the, down the aggressive route and just uh, set p equals 2 and uh, see what happens. Okay? So what this means here is uh, now it's, like, it's sort of the same thing as trying to solve this SDP, but only looking at matrices of rank at most 2 which breaks convexity. Um, but by breaking convexity, we actually introduced another property which is quite nice, and which is smoothness. Because if we look at this, uh, these constraints here, it tells us that the diagonal entries of y, y transpose have, all have to be 1. And if you think of the individual rows of y, my new variable, if you think of the individual rows, what this constraint says is that each of these rows must have unit norm. Okay. So y really is a set of n points, and each of these points is on a circle in R2. Okay, so the, 
the space in which y lives is a, an n torus, if you want to call it that way, product of n circles, and that's a nice smooth space. And there's a lot that is known about pr doing optimization in smooth, uh, on smooth manifolds uh, like this. Uh, but of course, this is a non-convex task. So in general, uh, these optimization methods, they can, only, they can only guarantee that you'll go to KKT points, or maybe second order KKT points. And the question then is, well, are these KKT points relevant for the statistical task at hand? So I'm not going to try to uh, argue that we can solve this non-convex problem to global optimality. That's not what I'm interested in. What I will try to, what I, well, the point I will make is that KKT points, points which satisfy necessary optimality conditions for this problem are statistically relevant. And that's all I care about for, for, this, uh, for this question that I'm looking at. Okay. So uh, we, run a, we run a small numerical example to check that the, uh, you know, that it makes sense to, to be looking at this uh, heuristic. For now, it's just a heuristic. Uh, and uh, we pick this setting where it's the uh, constant average degree regime, the first regime. P is 10 over n, Q is 2 over n. Uh, so that's the in, uh, in connection and cross connection. And this amounts to a signal to noise ratio lambda of 1.6. So it's above 1. We're in uh, good shape to say something non trivial. Uh, but it's, it's not quite big. In particular, it's not growing with n. So there's little chance that we'll be able to. Uh, get back the exact, uh, the exact partition for large values of n, okay? So based on these values, we uh, run, this is uh, on, the x on the x-axis, we have on a log scale uh, growing values of n from uh, let's say 100 here to uh, more than 200,000 over here. And uh, on the y-axis, we have a correlation between the estimator that we produce with, our, uh, with uh, here three methods and the ground truth that we're trying to recover, the true partition. In yellow here, you see uh, the correlation you would get with a random guess, just as a benchmark to be sure that we're doing at least better than this. The orange line over here, the orange curve, that's what you get if you actually solve the semi-definite program to global optimality using an interior point method. And this is an interior point method whose code was written specifically to, write, to solve that SDP, so it's not some generic software. And the uh, blue curve here tells you what we get with the heuristic that I just described, where you do local optimization on the torus by where you have restricted the rank of x to be at most 2. OK, and we see that both methods uh, give you non-trivial correlation with the ground truth. But the big difference between the two is that here we look at the same, uh, this is the same experiment, except uh, on the y-axis we have computation time. And we see that, uh, that the, uh, the blue curve, well, is nicer. OK, we get, uh, we get faster computations. This is, uh, this is essentially uh, doing. Uh, it's essentially doing the job of solving the SDP, but with 272,000 nodes, uh, which is a pretty big SDP to be solving on a laptop. OK? All right. So based on this observation, uh, we want to, uh, we want to uh, say something about the statistical performance of whatever you get when you run this local method. And we have uh, two statements, one, uh, one about uh, when is it true that you get non-trivial correlation. And uh, here we see that the statement is as follows. Uh, if you place yourself in a constant average degree regime, then you have the same beginning of a statement uh, as we had previously for when you solved the SDP, except now we need lambda to be bigger than 8 plus delta. And here we would have liked to see a 1 plus delta. And based on experiments, I don't think this 8 is a real thing. I think it's just a problem in our, in our techniques. But the point is that up to this constant that it wouldn't get right, uh, it is true that uh, the heuristic gives you something that has non trivial correlation. Okay, so it's doing something interesting. And for this, you only need to compute points which satisfy first and second order necessary conditions. Okay, I actually outlined the proof of this statement because it's fairly easy. Uh, and the second uh, result that we have, this one is uh, even more suboptimal res with respect to what we are trying to achieve, but it's still a start. It says that uh, if you place yourself in the dense regime, uh, the nicer regime, and you let lambdas, the signal to noise ratio, grow as n to the 1 over 3, which is quite a bit more than what we were hoping for, square root of log n, uh, but still, uh, then you know that all second order KKT points actually gives you the exact partition. Okay, so there is some notion there that, uh, you know, uh, by the way, this n to the 1 over 3 is also a problem, it's definitely a problem in the proof. I don't know if we can get it all the way down to the right ratio, but okay. All right, so let me uh, outline the proof uh, very quickly uh, for the non-trivial correlation, uh, uh, the non-trivial correlation regime, uh, just to make the statement that it's not difficult at all to make this kind of uh, statements. 
Uh, so maybe we can apply it to different, uh, to different tasks. Okay, the, the first step is simply, since we're trying to make a statement about KKT points, about second order KKT points on a, on a torus, uh, let's start with what defines these points. And just like when you do optimization without constraints, the KKT conditions are that the gradient must be zero and the Hessian must be positive semi-definite. Here you'll have the same kind of thing, but on a manifold. So the Hessian here is some operator on the tangent space to the torus, fine. The bottom line is that when you write down this condition, you end up with a matrix inequality that is, has to be valid at any such point. And because this matrix is bigger than that one in the lunar sense, uh, you can, uh, you can hit it with, uh, with uh, anything that's PSD on the left and on the right, and this will give you a scalar inequality, okay? Now, um, we decided to hit it with something that has a true signal in it, which should uh, reveal something uh, interesting, hopefully. Uh, at this point, you want to bring in what you know about A prime, which is your data, and which carries some information about the signal, but buried with some noise in it, and the noise scales down with the lambda, your signal to noise ratio. There's some algebra, you have to make a statement about how the noise here, the perturbation E, uh, is not too aligned with competing signals, otherwise it might beat you. And this is actually something we take from a paper by Montanari and Sen. There's some more algebra and you get that the correlation here, if you scale by n squared, is bigger than a constant minus something that you can make small if you take lambda big enough, okay? And this is the, the point. All right, uh, you can actually do this even if you only compute a point that only approximately satisfies KKT conditions, which might be useful for uh, establishing computation bounds uh, for which we'll need more work on computation, uh, computational complexity of optimization on manifolds. This is a start. And if you're interested in solving semi-definite programs uh, using this Borel Montero low rank approach, uh, I'd like to advertise this work, which is with the same collaborators as here, where we actually look at how you can get all the way to the global optimizer of the SDP. Uh, and okay.